If we continue to follow the trail of scattered pieces left to us, we can reclaim our divinity once again. But for us to know our divinity, we must also know thyself. As the ancient Egyptian proverb tells us, the kingdom of heaven is within you, and whosoever shall know himself shall find it. And this is because we are all ethereal beings, but we have forgotten this. So before we can unlock and understand the meanings within all the symbolism, we must first know who we are. This is where the key of the tarot, along with the newly uncovered knowledge from ancient Egypt, help us to reveal the truth that has been hidden for so long. To begin to know ourselves, we must once again think to the Fibonacci sequence and remember that everything expands and grows using this sequence along with sacred geometry. When we use this universal sequence of numbers and the golden mean spiral, along with the tarot, we begin to see this hidden information revealed. Everything in our universe births, expands and grows using this blueprint. When we look further into the golden mean spiral, we can see it is divided into sections. When we correspond these golden mean sections to the major arcana in the tarot, we begin to understand the evolution of our souls and our true divinity. However, before we start down the path of the tarot and begin to unravel their secrets, let's first get a bit of history to this key that has been left to us. The tarot's original author is unknown. It is also uncertain as to exactly where and when the tarot came into existence. But it is believed that it originated in ancient Egypt about three and a half thousand years ago and was brought to Europe by the Rom or Gypsies as they traveled to Europe from India. Due to the increasing religious intolerance of the Antichrist Catholics and their attempts to suppress esoteric knowledge and sacred truths from humanity, the Magi who were in possession of this sacred knowledge were forced to encrypt these secrets into the tarot cards to keep this ancient wisdom safe from manipulation and destruction. The tarot was devised using the principles of the Kabbalah, but we can also see symbolism from ancient Egypt, the runes, astrology and numerology. And they also equate to the chakras and colour symbolism. The tarot consists of a deck of 78 cards in total. This is made up of 22 major arcana cards numbered from 0 to 21. And the minor arcana consist of 56 cards. However, it is the major arcana cards that we will focus on to help us decode this hidden information. So now we have an understanding of the importance of the tarot and that they are not just some novelty for telling fortunes as we have been led to believe. So let's now look at the first card. The first card is the zero card. And not only does the zero card represent the beginning of the major arcana in the tarot, but it is also the first number of the Fibonacci sequence. This card number zero equates to the fool and represents Orion, the location for the God consciousness of our material realm. We can see this also in the Viconti tarot cards that surfaced around the 15th century. On this card, you can see a clear depiction of Orion with his club and feathers in his hair. We see that the Rider Waite tarot card also shows the fool with a feather in his cap. And if we look at ancient constellation maps, we see that Orion is depicted with a club and once again feathers in his cap. These feathers, as with the feather that is placed on the scale to be weighed against the heart in the ancient Egyptian weighing of the heart ceremony, are symbolic of the god light of Orion. Some feathers, like peacock and duck feathers, display their colour with a process called structural colouring instead of pigment. Structural colouring is where the cellular structure of the feather, or as with the shells of scarab beetles, are actually formed in a way 
where they refract wavelengths of light to create their color. So once again, we see this connection to changing angles of light also contained within this symbolism. This is where the term feather in your cap originates from. This term was used to describe a great achievement or special honor. And of course, for those whose hearts are equal in weight to the feather, that is a great achievement and special honor indeed, for they are rewarded with the highest consciousness in Zep Tepi, or Aru, the field of reeds, as the ancient Egyptians described their Garden of Eden. We must pay attention to some of these old sayings, as they are actually remnants of truths that have managed to survive. Now, when we look to the Kabbalah Tree of Life, we see that the very top, Sephirot, is also connected to Orion and the Fool card. This Sephirot is called Ketha, which means crown. It is also interpreted as both the topmost and regal crown. Just like the crown chakra, it sits above the head and is not a part of the body. And this is also why it is known as the crown because a crown is worn above the head. The symbol of the crown is also seen in many alchemical drawings of the male and female twin souls and is symbolic of the reuniting with God consciousness and thus being crowned. This is why royalty wears crowns as they are emanating this crowning of God consciousness. However, they are nothing but mere frauds that took the opportunity to enslave the masses and crown themselves. All of the other sephirot below the crown are likened to the body, which starts with the head, depicted by Chokma and Bina, with Dalith symbolic of the third eye chakra directly located in the middle. The third eye is also related to the pineal gland, if we are to take the perspective of this area in the physical and not the ethereal body. Dalith is also called the door or the door of the tent and is symbolic for this energy point being the gateway to God consciousness, which is located at the crown. If we look to Hindu mythology, we see that they saw the third eye chakra as a gateway for they believed that the spiritual energy from the external environments could enter their body through this gateway and hence they take the utmost precaution in protecting it with spiritually positive protecting forces. From this point in the Kabbalah tree, it descends downwards until it reaches the root chakra that equates to Malkuth. But the symbolism on the Fool card is not only symbolic of Orion, our God consciousness. It is also symbolizing the potential soul before it has been birthed into existence and splits into twin souls of male and female. Once again, if we look to Ketha on the Kabbalah tree of life, it represents the primal stirrings of intent in the Ein Sof. Ein Sof in Kabbalah means God prior to his self-manifestation. And this is because God manifests a part of himself within the souls that are birthed onto the material realm. It is also said that Ketha is so sublime, it is called in the Zohar the most hidden of all hidden things and is completely incomprehensible to man. This is once again speaking of God. For what else but God can be so incomprehensible to man? On the card we see the fool is being depicted in the ethereal walking towards the cliff's edge in innocence, completely unaware that he is about to be manifest onto the material realm below. In his pack, he is holding the unknown potential of the souls. We see this is also connected to Ketha in that it contains all the potential for content, though it contains no content itself and is therefore called nothing. And we know the number zero also equates to nothing. The soul's purity is also symbolized by the white flower. At this point, as the number zero and Ketha symbolizes, 
they are still only just a potential in God's consciousness, for they are not yet manifest. The white sun is symbolic of the galactic core, Atum, and the dog is representing Sirius, or Canis Majoris, which is also called the dog star. In ancient times, the season following the star's appearance came to be known as the dog days of summer, and coins retrieved from the island of Sios in the Aegean Sea from the 3rd century BC feature dogs or stars with emanating rays highlighting Sirius' importance. Orion's belt also points to the brightest star in the sky, and that star is Sirius. Orion's belt and Sirius also line up with significant locations of ancient sites around the world. We see this with the Hopi Messus that lines up with Orion's belt, and then we see Sirius correlating to the Chaco Canyon. In Mexico City, the Street of the Dead lines up with Orion's belt, and Sirius correlates to the largest pyramid complex in the world, Cholula, the Great Pyramid of the Sun. In Egypt, we see that Orion's belt lines up with the three pyramids of Giza, and Sirius lines up to Heliopolis, which is one of the oldest cities in Egypt, and also known as the City of the Sun. So we can see that Orion and Sirius are definitely related to each other and have an important connection. So it is not surprising we see the symbol for Sirius in the form of a white dog on the full card. In the other symbolism of the card, we see the ice and the sun symbolic of the polarity of God's infinite energy. For energy is always equal in polarity of positive and negative. That is what gives energy its force and momentum. So now that we understand what the Fool card is really representing, we will now look at the male and female twin souls once they have manifest into existence.